All right, who's getting hungry? All right, you're starting, it's like, who's like, all right, pastor, let's, let's uh, keep it tight this morning. I got, I got plans for, for lunch. I, I got to tell you, that, that's probably not going to happen. Um, and I'm, I'm still a little full from, from, from last night. Um, I, I was up really late eating very bad food. So if I'm just not on my game this morning, I got it honestly watching the, the UFC fights uh, last night till uh, like midnight, uh, watching Holly Holmes and Colin McGregor both go down. And uh, m- meanwhile, I was trying to put down grocery store chicken wings and... Uh, <laughs> And, and, and potato wedges, not my standard fare. Uh, don't tell my wife who's sitting in the front row. But, but when guys get to, I mean, it's like after a week of leading Bible studies and prayer meetings, uh, there's just that carnal nature to watch men and women pummel one another in the, in the octagon. And, and, and you just can't eat quinoa. When, when, you're, when you're watching the UFC fights, right? You, you, so I, I, so, but Friday night, Friday night, my, uh, my wife, Dee and I, we went out with my brother and sister-in-law. And, and so about once every six, eight weeks, we, we kind of get together. They live in Chesterfield. And so we try to get together and, and just share life together and try to find a brand new restaurant and go. And went to this place down in the city and, and uh, it was great. It's called Peacemakers and it's lobster and crab. And they got fresh fee- seafood. They fly it in every day. And, and it's very informal and, and intimate. And, and it's just very, very casual. And the line was like two hours long. Thank you, no wait app. So you need to you, you take, even if you're a pagan and you're not even listening for Jesus, you need to, you need to download, download the no wait app if you like to eat out. Do the Morningstar app when you're at the app store, but download both of those because we walked in and 15 minutes later, man, we were eating some crab. It was, it was great. Tonight, tonight, our, our neighbors uh, next door have invited us over for dinner. And uh, they don't go to church. They have a church background. They believe in God, but uh, they just had a little baby. And so we've been trying to develop a relationship and be a bridge uh, between them and, and, and the church. And we share a common interest, our love for cooking and food. Um, so we're going to be sharing dinner with them tonight. And maybe you think, wow, that's what you do as you're the pastor. You just go eat out all the time. And <laughs> And that's right. That's what we do. Um, now, uh, this weekend was actually a little busier than most. But, but on, honestly, Didi and I really love our, our meal times. And, and we, we know that, that, that some of life's best moments for us and just in general are often shared around a common table, eating food and breaking bread with, with one another. And so we try to take one or two nights every week and, and just make an intentional opportunity to, to share that meal with, with someone else. Now, eating food uh, isn't just about physical. Uh, it's not just about feeding our, our bodies. It's something deeper. In the Bible, e- eating food is a, is a relational experience. It's, it's a soul kind of relationship. E- cooking meals for one another, if you kind of study cultures, cooking meals and, and inviting people to, to sit down at a table and share a meal is, has been a way that, that people from every culture and every generation have expressed love and acceptance and, and a tolerance, a, a willingness to kind of get to know and put down guards and, and welcome and practice grace and, and, and generosity with one another. And I think this stems from, from our God who, who knows and knew from the very beginning uh, what it's taken us a while to figure out, that food is oftentimes the best way to a man and a woman's heart. That food is a, a great pathway to, to get into our hearts and lives. And throughout scripture, we see God using food in a real way and also in a symbolic way to kind of demonstrate, to communicate his goodness. His richness and the fact that he wants to take his richness and be a blessing to us. Look at what scripture says in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah chapter 25. It says, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. Isaiah is pointing to a time in heaven when the people are going to gather around this great banquet table. Solomon, great King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He said, you know, there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. 
And so it's not surprising that when God released his people from slavery in Egypt and brought them into a land, this promised land, he would describe this land using food, right? Leviticus chapter 20 says, but I say to you, you will possess their land. I will give it to you as an inheritance and it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, in the Old Testament, if you're reading through, you're going to see these, these things called feast. And, and God's people would, would celebrate feast. And, and feasts were basically rituals, sacred meals that the Jewish people would share to memorialize, to remember some of the biggest God moments in their history. Some of the defining moments when God stepped into the life of Israel and, and delivered them in, in mighty, incredible ways. And, and probably the biggest was the, the, the Passover meal where each of the items on that Passover, that, it's called the Seder meal, each of the items on that Seder meal was symbolic. It represented a part of what God did that, that first Passover when the Israelites were, were in slavery. God had wreaked down nine plagues from heaven saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh had stonewalled. Then God said, hey, we're going we're gonna to unleash the, the last plague, the death of the firstborn. Tells Moses, tell all the Hebrew people, take and slaughter a, a lamb, take the blood of the lamb, paint it over the doorpost of your house. So when the angel of death passes over, that's where we get Passover, when the angel of death passes over and sees the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, it will not kill the firstborn son in those houses, but on those houses that don't have the blood of the lamb, the e Egyptian houses, that curse will fall. And it did. There were many firstborn that died in, in Egypt's households that night. And it was kind of the linchpin that said to Pharaoh, um, hey, God is more powerful than you are. And Pharaoh said to Moses, get out. And, and, and they were on the run. And even to this day, Jewish families gather in their homes, invite other Jewish or even Gentile families to come in and share the meal. They don't do this at church. They share it around their own table. And it's, they tell the story as they eat their food as a way to remember what God had done. And so not surprisingly, one of the most defining moments in the Christian life, celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion, is done around the table, representing one of Jesus' most famous meals, the, the Last Supper, where Jesus gathered in that upper room with his disciples the night he would be betrayed. They were actually celebrating that Passover meal, remembering God's deliverance from slavery to sin and death. And, and, and Jesus takes elements bread that, that represented one thing in the Passover meal. And he said, now this bread represents my body, which is about to be broken for you. Then Jesus took one of the four cups of wine. And if, if that sounds a little extreme, they were probably not Missouri pours. They were probably just, you know, a little, uh, a little tasting. Four, uh, four glasses of wine. The last one, he took the, the cup and he said, um, hey, this cup now represents my blood of the new covenant, which is about to be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so Jesus' death on the cross, his body broken and his blood poured out is memorialized for us around this sacred Eucharistic meal. I love what pastor and author Leonard Sweet, who wrote the book Nudge, that this series is named after, he writes this. He says, you got to love a religion that ritualizes its most sacred moment, not with trumpets blaring or guns blazing, but with food, bread broken and wine poured. But listen, listen, this is good news. It's not just in these high holy moments of gathering as a church family and celebrating the Eucharist that we can experience God. We can experience the presence of God every time we sit down to eat a meal. It's not something we have to add on to our otherwise full and hectic lives. It's to take advantage of something that most of us do two, three, maybe four times every single day where we can eat and taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Or as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, give glory to God. Do it all for his glory. And, and so today, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. How we, can, how we can challenge one another that every time we sit down at the meal, that we can, we can look at that food and taste and see that God, that God is good, that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And, and that food can draw us closer into a, a, a relationship of gratitude for our heavenly father to point us to that bread of heaven that is Jesus Christ that he feeds our soul with. And also that we can take those meals and, and use it in every opportunity to give glory to God by inviting others every now and then to sit at table with us and that God would use us to be those seed planters or, in the words of Leonard Sweet, those nudgers who would help other people taste and see God is good as well. Now, here's the problem. Here's kind of the, the hurdle that we have to overcome in the church. And it's our, our history, kind of what we're known for. Because the church throughout history has had a whole lot of food fights. And, and so back before Animal House and you know, um, some of you are just way too young. You have no idea. Don't go home and watch it. Um, but before the, the, the food fights ever started, the church was notorious for food fights. I mean, first there was this whole unclean and clean thing. If you were a Jewish person, there were certain animals that were off limits. You couldn't eat anything that was pork. And so, you know, then, then Jesus comes, he, he dies, he's resurrected. Peter's leaving the church. He gets this dream, this vision. And on this, in this dream, in this vision, there's a sheet that comes down from heaven. And on this sheet are all kinds of, of unclean animals. And, and Peter hears this voice, Peter, Peter, get up, kill and eat. God, God, no, God forbid, these are unclean animals, there's no way I, and then he hears it a second time, Peter, Peter, this is the Lord, get up, kill and eat. Friends, here's the deal, you gotta love a God who says you've been eating cheeseburgers without bacon for too long. <laughs> See, but before the church, you know, in the Old Testament, BLT stood for beets, lettuce, and tomato. Because of Jesus and because of, you know, food being, no food being unclean, we can have bacon, lettuce, and tomato. You've got to love that kind of God. Next food fight was whether or not Jesus' followers could eat food that was sacrificed to pagan idols. Most of Christianity was growing outside of Jerusalem in very Gentile cities, pagan cities, where, where meat was offered to pagan gods, pagan idols. The fat would be burned off and then the meat would be sold. And so there was this whole ruckus that went on for ever it seemed about whether we can eat that food or if that idol of but but there are no other gods so if there are no other gods I, I guess we got it naturally I guess you trace our, our propensity to fight over food all the way back to the garden of Eden when Adam and Eve's first food indiscretion led to them taking a bite out of that forbidden fruit and leading to the fall that separated us from God Ironically, this is amazing, ironically, one of the best known food fights in church history actually occurred over something called, you won't believe this, the love feast. The biggest food fight happened over something called the agape or the love feast. Now, the love feast was something that the church would do before gathering for worship. It wasn't celebrating Holy Communion. It was gathering together to, to share a meal. And, and we, we tend to think of ourselves as kind of social people. But the truth is, the ancient cultures were much more social than we were. It was nothing for them to gather with friends and family four or five times a week and share a common meal. Everybody would bring something, they'd put it out on the table and they'd all eat from it. There'd be enough for everyone. It was kind of the, the predecessor to our church potluck, if you will. Now, this fight occurred in churches that were in the, the city of Corinth. They didn't have a church like this. They, they met in houses. They were house churches. And, and so several of these house churches were experiencing these same kind of, of, of fights. And, and there, in, there in Corinth, uh, Paul was familiar with that. He had gone there. He writes about, a lot about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. 
Interestingly, in Corinth, there was the temple of the love goddess Aphrodite. But for Christians, in this city of brotherly and sisterly and pagan love, their very love feast showed absolutely no signs of love. And for Paul, that founded these churches, that loved these churches, this got him dialed up. He could get hot under the collar. We're going to read such words that he's writing. When he hears about what's going on, after he's left Corinth, um, he writes this letter back. He says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show you which of you have God's approval. He's exercising his his gift of sarcasm there, no doubt. So then he writes, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing. You see, in the city of Corinth, there were, there were two distinct sides of the track. There were the very rich and the well-to-do, and there were hundreds of thousands of slaves. The slave population was huge, and it was, it was critical to the, the work that went on in Corinth, because Corinth was on an isthmus, a piece of land that separated two big bodies of water, and ships would pull up into the harbor at Corinth. And instead of having to take a three-day journey that was very difficult along around the Cape, They could actually dock their boat and slaves would pull their boat kind of on a wooden rail system some three, four miles. They would pull the boats one after another. They could do this in one day, saving them two days of travel plus making it a whole lot safer. So the need for slave labor in Corinth was huge. So you had a whole bunch of slaves and you had a whole bunch of well-to-do people. Now, the well-to-do people would, would bring good stuff to the common meal. I mean, aged cheese, fine wine, the best of meats and fruits and vegetables. The, the slaves probably didn't have much to bring. For some of them, it was probably the, the one good meal that they could look forward to every week. But what happened is, some of the rich people got together. They sent out an Evite to one another and said, hey, let's gather, instead of gathering at six like we normally do, let's gather at, at five. Let's all bring our food, and we appreciate good food. We've got well-trained palates. Let's share food together, which they did. And when the poor slaves showed up, really the ones needing to eat, there was nothing left over. So the very meal that should have bridged a lot of division actually exacerbated those divisions. This is what dialed up the apostle Paul. Now, interestingly, interestingly, while the church has had its fair share of food fights, our founder, our savior Jesus, knew how to do food and fellowship very well. He, needed to do, he knew how to do it well. So like just about every other area of life, we would do well to take our cues from Jesus. Church etiquette is to be modeled after Jesus. So let's take the church etiquette of food and model it after Jesus' table manners. Jesus had a lot of his life with people around tables, and we can learn a lot about how to do life and how to do meals by watching how Jesus did meals. That he would not only give thanks to God for the physical food, but he would use that meal time with others to nudge them to taste and see that his heavenly father was in fact good. Let's take a look. You've heard about your manners. I don't know what your manners are. Maybe you're not supposed to burp at the the table. Maybe you're supposed to keep your napkin in your lap. You're supposed to eat with your silverware from the outside in. Don't know why there's six spoons on the top of those four. That's above my pay grade. Jesus is going to, his table manners are accessible to all of us. And the first table manner Jesus teaches us is offer your best. Jesus always offered his best. I think about the first miracle. The first miracle that Jesus performed wasn't in a temple or synagogue. It was at a wedding. 
He didn't heal a blind man or make a lame man walk. Instead, he turned water into wine. Now, what was about to occur was a social faux pas. The host of the wedding, um, the, the, groom, the, the, the father of the bride, was about to get a social black mark. Because they were running out of wine and the party was just getting lit up. So the host comes and he says, Jesus, hey, can you do something to help? And Jesus' mom, Mary, says, come on, Jesus, it's time for you to step up and, and, and start doing something. This was his first miracle, had not done anything yet, hadn't preached a sermon yet. And so Jesus said, with a little resistance, hey, host, tell your servants, bring me some jugs of water. They brought these, these large jugs that held like 25 gallons of water each. And Jesus said, go fill them up with water. They went and filled them up and they brought them back. And she said, okay, now start drinking that. And when they tasted it, it was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing stuff. And, and it was like this amazing, great wine. And it was, it was they, they started serving and the people couldn't believe it because in, in those days, the ritual was you served your best wine first. And once people were kind of lit up, you broke out the Boone's farm. But this was just the opposite. I mean, this was such incredible. It was like Opus One, right? And it was like such great wine and people were astounded. But, but if Jesus is gonna come to the table, hey, Jesus is gonna bring his best. Second thing, Jesus eats sumptuous food with sinful people. He eats good food with less than godly people. You know, in Jesus' day, mealtime was the most segregated hour of the day. See, Jews and Gentiles weren't allowed to eat with one another. There are all kinds of regulations about how you could use food and who you could eat with. And, and what we see in the Gospels is that Jesus is stepping over every one of those boundaries and barriers. In Judaism, food was, was, was really designed to keep people kind of separated. Jesus used pe food to bring people together. The two best instances are, are tax collectors, both tax collectors. One was a guy named Matthew, also known as Levi. He was sitting at his tax booth and Jesus was picking disciples and said, Matthew, you look good as anybody. Come follow me. So Matthew got up from his tax booth, he left. First thing he did, he said, well, Jesus, before we, why don't you come back to, to my house? I'm gonna throw a party. And kind of like Garth Brooks, all his, his you know, friends in low places showed up. So did the Pharisees. And the Pharisees was outside talking to Jesus' disciples. I can't believe that your master, Jesus, is in there eating with tax collectors. There's prostitutes and sinners. Jesus overhears these guys and says, hey, you got it all wrong, guys. The son of man didn't come to, to heal those who are well. The, the well people have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, those who are, those are the people I've come from. Jesus also, he he reached out to a little tax collector who had a, he had a small man complex. His name was Zacchaeus. Remember him? If you grew up in the church, you sang, sang about him. He climbed up in that sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And Jesus said, hey, Zacchaeus, come on down because I want to go to your house today. He goes to Zacchaeus' house and, and just like Levi, just like Matthew, Zacchaeus' life is forever changed just because Jesus wasn't afraid to go and sit down at Zacchaeus' table. And what happened in Zacchaeus' heart is kind of like the Grinch. It grew three sizes that day. And he began to repay people all the money that he had swindled out of them over the years. So when Jesus sits at our table, he's going to bring his best. And he's going to be willing to eat good food with, with less than godly people. And that's good news. In fact, Jesus himself said, he said, I get it. I know what people have been saying. Listen to what he says in Matthew 11. He said, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus uh, was known by who he hung out with. He was labeled a drunkard. He was labeled a glutton. Third table manner is that Jesus prefers radical hospitality over entertaining. Well, that's the difference. Well, there's a lot of difference. See, hospitality is focused on the guest. Entertaining is focused on the host. Hospitality is focused on serving the people who've come. Entertaining is about impressing the people who've come with your meal, with your table, with your dishes, with your food, with your whatever. 
There's a huge difference between hospitality and entertaining. And I think about, I think about people who were there um, at that, that, that last, I think about that last meal that Jesus would serve. I mean, Jesus' last meal, the upper room, the last supper that this meal is patterned after, right? And, uh, and before they sat down to eat, nobody had washed feet. So what did Jesus do? Jesus got up, his last meal, did I mention that? The master, he was the host. Yeah, he was the host, but he was also the host. And so the host served. He got up, he took a, put a towel around his waist, he got a basin, he washed the disciples' feet. My guess is there were not just the, the 12 guys, but also a lot of women there. I bet Jesus washed all their feet. Then he looked at them and said, hey, I've set an example. You should go and do for others as I've done for you. For the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. And as you'll see, to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus is always going to bring his best. He's going to be willing to sit and eat sumptuous food with sinful people. He's going to practice and prefer radical hospitality to put the focus on others instead of entertaining to put the focus on himself. And finally, Jesus' table is open to all. It's open to everyone. I think about the guest list at that Last Supper. I mean, these were not the, the rich and the famous. This was not the, the social up-and-comers. This was not the religiously pious, the best of the best of the best. No, the people on, on Jesus' guest list were common, everyday, you know, fishermen, the downwardly mobile. You mean, you, you think about the people that were seated around that table, and they were all around that table. We usually see, you know, the the. the Pick, the time the photographer came in, it was the Last Supper, and Jesus said, hey, everybody, get on this side so I take a picture. And, th and that's what we always see. But, but they actually sat all the way around the, that, that table, and, and, you know, you had, you know, Peter who, who denied Jesus, and you had, you know, Thomas who doubted Jesus, and you had Judas at that table who would betray Jesus. See, Jesus never refused he never refused an invitation to sit at someone else's table, no matter who they were or what they'd done. And Jesus was always about inviting anyone and everyone to sit at his table, and so do we. See, this table isn't our table. It's not our, a church's table. It's not a pastor's table. It's not a denomination's table. This is Jesus' table. I love what Madeline Langle said. Uh, if this is God's table, who are we to create the guest list? This is God's table. This is Darden Prairie. It's not Corinth. This is where we practice love and acceptance and openness to all. And this table is also a place where we remember that as we eat that bread and we dip it in the, the juice, not wine, juice out of respect for those in recovery, we remember the body and blood of Jesus poured out. We're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes in this sacred meal. And we're also learning we're reminding ourselves of Jesus' table manners so that when we're out in the world and other people are coming to our table, how to practice hospitality toward them. Because when we do, when we exhibit Jesus' table manners, when we have such good taste as to do that, then we actually put the good taste of Jesus in other people's mouths. Because I gotta tell you, Right now, a lot of people outside the church have a very sour taste in their mouth about the church. Not about Jesus, but about the church. They think the church is nothing but a bunch of tight-fisted, greedy, judgmental hypocrites. And most of us are. And they'd feel right at home, because they are too. We're just a bunch of imperfect people here at the church. And it's our opportunity, friends, to take something that we do two, three, four times a week, not add to, but just invite people to share. I love what Daniel Sachs said, shared meals. Shared meals are often more important to creating community than our shared worship experiences. This is the power of food and fellowship. Now listen, before we close, our job at the table our job isn't to be the food. The food is Jesus, okay? 
He's the bread of heaven. He's the bread of life. He's the main course. He's the meal. He's the big deal. Our role? Our role is to be the appetizers. And appetizers do what? They make others hunger and thirst for Jesus. We're a foretaste of something that's coming that's bigger and better than we could ever be. This is what Tim Dearborn says. We will look at Christians' role as appetizers for the world. We're to live in such a way that when the world bites into us, gets a taste of us, its appetite will be stimulated for more. We are to be the hors d'oeuvres of the future kingdom banquet. That right now, that we would be known by the love that we have for one another. And when people are brought into those orbits of our love, that we would be a foretaste of the kingdom, that we would be an hors d'oeuvre for that time in heaven when we sit at Jesus' table and we feast on what God has set before us. So here's my challenge, church. Every single one of us. Hey, if you're, if you're retired and you're single, or maybe you're a single parent, you're, maybe you're married, maybe you're a young person, this applies to every one of us. Here's what I want us to do. Two things. Two things are the challenge today. First is, every time we sit down at a meal, we pray. Every time at home, you pray. Every time you're out, every time at school. And listen, listen, this is not what I'm talking about where you're at Texas Roadhouse or you're at McDonald's. Hey, kids, let's join hands. Father, (laughs) dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this bountiful food. (laughs) Bless this food to our bodies. First of all, if you're at McDonald's and you ask the Lord to bless that food to your body, there's, I mean, a miracle will only go so far. I mean, he can turn water to wine, but just thank him for it. Don't ask him to bless that food to your body. <laughs> Seriously? It's like, you know, it's like last night with the chicken wings and potato wedges. God, just, I give you thanks for this. <laughs> but you can give God thanks every time you have a meal and you just remember to taste and see that the Lord is good. And he's okay if you pig out every now and then. Second challenge is find one or two persons. Maybe it's an individual. Maybe it's a couple. Maybe it's a family. And best you can tell, they don't have a relationship with God or a church home. And you take this next week and you pray for them every day. Maybe it's when you bow your head at your meal. Maybe you pray for them three days or three times a day, 21 times. You skip one, I'll give you a grace. 20 times you've prayed for somebody. At the end of the week, you invite them over for a meal. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. You don't have to get out the white tablecloths, but whatever you do, you're gonna bring your best. Probably not Cheetos and corn chips. But it doesn't have to be filet mignon and lobster. Okay? But you bring your best. You make it nice. And it's not just about what you put on the table. It's about how you show up. You love on them. You, you, you listen to them. You take more interest in what they're going to say rather than what you're going to say. If I can remember this quote from Aristotle from a couple of weeks ago, wisdom comes from a lifetime of listening when we'd rather be speaking. So be wise, invite people over, love on them, bring your best. And then here's the key, right before you get ready to dig into the meal, just say just very naturally, hey, let me, let me pray before we dig in. And you pray and you thank God for the food and you thank God for the opportunity to share that meal with those people. And then you speak a blessing over them. And you're like, well, I could never do that, especially that blessing part. Are you available, pastor? You could come over and give a blessing. Let you in the back door. You could fly out through the, through the garage when it's all done. We'll give you a doggy bag. It's not that hard. Seriously, it can be, it can be this, this easy. It doesn't really need to be bigger than, longer than this. Hey, guys, before we dig in, let's just, uh, let's just pray. Again, don't apologize. Just, hey, this is what we do. God, we thank, you for, uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather around this table. We thank you for this food and just the opportunity to, to gather with the Johnsons, God, and, and, and for Pat and, and, and Sue and, and their family. God, I just pray that you'd bless them. You'd bless them this week and show yourself strong in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, that, that was really spiritual, huh? You went to seminary for three years for that? That's something I could, yeah. That's something you could do. And it's a whole lot more powerful when you do it than inviting a professional in to. See, God wants to use you. He wants to use you as a bridge, as a conduit 
to people who are far from him. Just as he's used other people to bring you in to his family, to his fellowship, to use you to plant seeds and to nudge others to taste and see that the Lord is good so that someday they might sing in their soul words that I grew up singing and maybe you grew up singing if you're in the church. Words to the hymn penned by Francis Crosby who says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born in his spirit, washed in his blood. Oh, what a foretaste of kingdom, of heaven divine. God, um, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this meal that on the night in which he would be betrayed, he took bread, he broke bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This bread now represents my body, which is about to be broken for you. Likewise, after the supper, Jesus took one of the cups. Again, he gave thanks to God gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This cup now represents my blood of the new covenant, which is about to be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so God, we would ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. May they be for us the body and blood of Jesus that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. God, make us one, really, really one. One with you, one with each other, and one in mission and ministry to all the world until Jesus comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet.